Well, uh, Pastor Gwen, thank you for the opportunity again to stand behind this pulpit. I count it an honor, and it's always a blessing to, to be able to... I enjoy these Tuesdays we get to, to share together and, and just be together, and, and just uh, such an honor. Let's open up to John 15, and uh, I was praying just about asking the Lord about you know what I should minister on and, and what word we should bring. And um, about a month ago, or probably about six weeks ago, I guess, it's been a little longer than a month... Um, Man, we're in October. I mean, that's crazy. Um, <laughs> the Lord, the Lord, uh, just in my one of my prayer times, um, the Lord spoke some things to me, and um, you know, I want to share a couple of those things with you. A couple of the things that that He shared with me. I've been sharing this at my church uh, at Destiny, and um, and I just really felt like that that it was a, a, a word for for us here at Healing School today as well. But uh, so I was, I was just um, communing with the Lord one morning, and and uh, and I heard this question just rise up in my spirit. And you know, how many of you know that uh, when when the, <laughs> I, I've come to find out when the Lord asks you a question, a lot of the times it's not the immediate answer He's wanting, the obvious, you know. And you'll, you'll understand that when I because when I tell you this question, you'll understand why I said that. So, uh, so I was just, I was there just, you know, talking to him, just, I had the word open. I was just, you know, reading, meditating on some things. And I heard this question on the inside, just rise up. He said this, do you need me today? And you know, my immediate, my immediate answer was, well, of course I need you. I mean, you know, everybody needs you. You know, and then, so as I was, I, and, and then as soon as I answered that, I thought to myself, okay, okay, if he asked me that question, it's deeper than just a yes. It's deeper than just a, yeah, I need you, you know. So I started asking the Lord, okay, Lord, what are you, where are you going with this? Where, you know, what are you trying to, what are you trying to, to speak to me about this? And, um, and then he asked this question. He said, he said, do you think that the church as a whole, not, not talking about just destiny, but just the body of Christ as a whole. He said, do you think that they need me every day of their life? You know, and, and there again, it's easy to say yes, but, but there was something deeper he wanted, right? Something, some, somewhere else he was wanting to take me. So, so I was, you know, so for a couple of days, really, to be honest with you, I was meditating on that, just murmuring or just let, letting it letting it ruminate in me, you know, just just going over and over and over. And uh, so then, so then, a couple of days later, um, the Holy Spirit started talking to me about this, and he said he made this statement to me, and and this kind of shocked me to be honest with you, but but you'll when when hopefully you'll understand where I'm going with this. But he said this statement. He said, you know, Stephen. He said most people. The majority, and he, he even used the word majority, and it kind of shocked me to be honest with you, but the more I thought about it, I could see this. He said the majority of people, the majority of Christians sitting in churches today, he said they, he said they go through their life, they go through their, their day, they go through the, the process of life, and they, they have no knowledge of me whatsoever. And he said if I never showed up and answered another prayer, he said, if I never showed up and I, I never showed up in a, in a f- uh, physical manifestation, in a tangible manifestation, he said, if I never did anything else spectacular for them, he said, most people wouldn't even miss me. And I, th- and I thought to myself, you know, now, <laughs> I don't know if you have this thought, but I thought to myself, Lord, I don't know that you're right in that. I was like, surely, I was like, surely people would miss you. But, now, but, but, but then, you know, and of course he didn't answer that because he, I, I understood that he was right and I was wrong. Um, but then he started talking to me about that. He said, now, he said, now think about it. He said, people come to church. He said, people pray. People read their Bible. But he said, people go, th- he said, there are people that have went through their whole life and never seen a major prayer answered. Never had a major encounter with me. Never let me really uh, uh, influence their life to the fact, to the point to where it's changed the way they live their life. And he said, and, and, and then the more, the more I was, you know, just meditating, just talking to the Lord about it, he said this. He said, most people just add me to their life. 
They take their life, their, they get up, they get ready, they eat breakfast. They, they, little, look, now look, they may even open the Word, read a few scriptures, say a quick little prayer before they head out the door. But then they go to work. And boom, they're at work. You know, they're, they're, they're busy at work. They're, they're just thinking about work. They're doing work. They come home. They're busy. They got kids going to the ball games. They got this. They got that. They got supper to fix. You know, they're just boom, 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 boom. And then, and then hopefully by the end of the night, they're, by the time they hit their bed, their head hits the pillow, hopefully they're going to be, they're, they'll say a lay me down to sleep prayer. And, and then they get up tomorrow and it starts all over. And, and how many times and how many people go to church on Sundays and, the, and they, you know, they sit in our, they sit in our seats and they walk out the door and that's the last time that they really give God an opportunity to encounter them until next Sunday. So the more I thought about that and the more I meditated on that, you know, he, you know, that statement that now just think about, it. I mean, how, how shocking it is, but how true it is. Most, a lot of, you know, and, and, and I, and I heard the word majority. He said the majority of people sitting in churches today w- wouldn't miss me if I, if I didn't show up. Because, because they're living their life and they just added God to it. As long as it's convenient, they'll go to church. As long as they have time, they'll open their word and read and pray. The first thing that goes, if, if, you, if you wake up late and you're, and you're in a time, time crunch, the first thing that goes is the word and the prayer. Oh, well, I'll catch up on that later. I'll pray on my way to work. Now, I mean, you know, we all pray on our way to work. But listen, your attention somewhere else. It should be. <laughs> Your attention should be on driving, right? I mean, so you're looking at other things. And, and you know, there's nothing wrong with praying while you're driving. But listen, um, I heard Jim Hockaday said this the last time he was there at the church. He said, he's, he said there's no multitasking in the spirit. <clears throat> you know, Jesus said this. When, now think about this. When, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness and, the, and, you know, they were murmuring and complaining and the snakes got let loose, you know, and, the, and they were biting people and dying. And, and God gave Moses the revelation to put the brazen serpent, <coughs> excuse me, on a pole. And he told them, he said, he said, you know, if anyone is bit, <clears throat> that if they will look upon that brazen serpent, they'll be healed. Well, <clears throat> that, that, you know, in that, that story, when you look at that word, it's not this, it's not, oh, there it is. Okay, I'm good. It's a focus. It's, I mean, you fix your gaze on that and you don't look anywhere else. And you keep your gaze there. And, you know, here in John 15, um, so, so anyway, so that started a, that started a a whole uh, thought process of me asking the Lord, you know, well, how do we, how do we overcome that? How do we, you know, what do I do as a pastor to, to help our church understand that the importance of having God in their life. And, um, <clears throat> you know, and listen, I, I love prayer. I mean, I, I, I spend, you know, I spend a lot of time in prayer. I love prayer. But um, the majority of Christians don't enjoy prayer. If you call for a prayer meeting, you may have five or six show up. And I've had people tell me, I've had people in my church tell me, Pastor, I don't think I could pray for an hour. You know, I don't know how, I don't know how to do that. I'd run out of things to say. And I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, it's obvious you had never been in prayer. Because prayer is not just, just you blabbering for an hour. It's a communion, right? It's, it's a conversation. It's a, it, it's a flowing with the Holy Ghost thing, you know. And um, so... So I was just asking the Lord about that, and, and He started showing me some things here. And I, so I want to talk to you this morning about, here's, here's my subject in this, and where the Lord led me. But I want to talk to you about living a no-doubt life. Living doubt-free. Because see, really the reality is, is this. One reason people don't enjoy prayer, one reason people don't do that, the, the reason that they, they go through life without experiencing God, is because of... Um, 
let me see how to say that. Because of past failures, right? They've prayed for something and it didn't come, it didn't, it didn't happen like they thought it was going to happen. You know, the person died or the, or the, the, you know, this happened or that happened and I didn't want that to happen. And so, you know, people, people, uh, people use that and they, and, and the enemy uses that to be honest with you against us. And, and they, you know, and he tells us, oh, well that see prayer doesn't work. It, it don't, it don't trust, you know, it's nothing to believe God, you know, you, it doesn't work. And so, so, um, but we understand this is that if we're, t- if, if we are trying to be like Jesus, then I think it's good to look at his life to see how he did it. Amen. 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 You know, one of the, uh, one of the only times we have recorded of the disciples asking Jesus specifically how to do something is when, is when they told him or when they asked him, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, why, why would, why would, why is, you know, you think about everything that Jesus did with the disciples. He raised the dead. He, uh, you know, he healed the sick. He, he, you know, arms grew out and leprosy disappeared and the demonic were, were set free. And I mean, man, there's all kinds of things. If I, if I spent time with Jesus, I'd be saying, show me how to do that. Yeah, I want to do that. Show me that. You know, he multiplied food. I mean, he did all these things. But the one thing they asked him to, they asked to show them Teach us how to pray. Now, why, 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 why is that? Because if you, if you study the life of Jesus, here was his routine. He would go to the mountain and spend time with his father. And when he would come off the mountain, miracles would happen. He would go to the mountain and pray. He would come off the mountain. De- the dead would be raised. He'd go to the mountain and pray. He would come down food would be multiplied. And all of a sudden in in the disciples' minds, something clicked and they're like, every time he goes to the mountain, every time he spends time with the Father, he comes back and things happen. So so instead of, and, and you know, and it was the right question because instead of saying, teach us how to do all these things, they said, they said, I want to go to the source. Show me, show us what happens on the mountain. Show show us what happens between you and the Father so that when you come off the mountain, all this stuff happens, right? And so so that was one of the questions they asked him. But but here in John 15, and I'll just pick a couple verses here in in this passage, but if you look at verse 7, John 15, 7, Jesus said this, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Amen. Turn and look at this, this thing right here. Uh, Pastor Gwen, showed, she said she put this banner up here. The Word of God is always right. Always. Jesus said, now listen, Jesus, told, Jesus in his teaching, he told them, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you'll ask whatever you will, whatever you desire, and it'll be done. <clears throat> How many of us believe that? How many of us are acting on that? How many of us act like that statement is true? But see, here's the key. See, we like the last part of that verse. We like the part that says whatever we desire will be given to us. And people are good at throwing their their desires on God, asking them, asking God to bless them, asking God to give them things. But how many of us are really doing the first part of that verse? If I abide in him, now what does it mean to abide? There again, just like, just like the children of Israel in the desert, it is not a glance. Abiding in him is not just coming to church Sunday morning and never thinking about him during the week. If I abide in him and then his word abides in me. So in other words, you know, I've got to spend time with him and I've got to abide in him. I've got to, I've got to stay in him. That word abide means a place where you stay. It's not a casual acquaintance type thing, but where you abide is where you stay. It's actually, and it's actually kind of a, um, in some, in some definitions of that is actually an army 
uh, like kind of a military term, meaning that where you abide is a military place where you, where you stand your ground and you're not going to let anybody take it from you. That's where you abide. You know, it's, it's forceful. I mean, you're staying in him. You're not going to let anything, circumstances or people or, or anything, you're not going to let anything keep you from abiding in him. And then the same thing, his word abides in us. Well, how does his word abide in us? We have to get his word in our hearts, right? The psalmist David knew that. He said, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. <clears throat> you, go on, you go on down and we'll look at verse eight. Now, I mean, I say I'm going to skip, but, but all this is so good. By this, so he says, you know, if you abide in me I, and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you desire and it'll be done for you. By this, my father is glorified. That you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. So, so listen, I mean, isn't that incredible that he said that when you get your prayers answered, it brings glory to God. And it will, it will show people and, and it will lead people to God. And here's the, rea- <laughs> here's the reality of this. <clears throat> people will actually look at you and say, Prayer actually works? How did you get that? Well, I prayed about it. I asked the Lord. I, I, I'm abiding in him and his, he's abiding in me, his words in me. And, and I asked what I desired and it's mine now. What? That works? <laughs> he goes on. Now, he, say, he goes on. He says, as my father has loved me, I also have loved you. Then he says this, abide in my love. Man, I mean, you, I could preach, you could preach on all that. I mean, but then look at verse 10, because I'm going somewhere. I want to get somewhere this morning with this. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Now, you know, one of the things that you hear people saying a lot today is, you know, you're hearing, you know, this and, uh, you know, there's always, there's always, uh, how do you say that? There's always people trying to pervert the gospel. And you'll hear people saying today, oh, you don't, you don't have to obey God. I mean, you don't have to keep the commandments. You know, God's love and grace covers everything. And, but what did Jesus say? When you, when you listen to the words of Jesus, I actually heard somebody say the other day, I think John maybe even mentioned this a couple weeks ago. Um, I think it was John I heard say this, but but there's actually people that, that will tell you that you need to read Paul's writings instead of, and not look at what Jesus did because he was still under the old covenant. Yes. And it doesn't really matter what he said. You need to read what Paul said, and it'll give you where we are today. Well, what, what was one of the main reasons Jesus came for? I mean, I know there's, there's you know, a list of those. But one of the main reasons he came was to show us the Father. Yes. Because he told the disciples, he said, if, they said, show us, show us the Father. And he said, he said, what? He said, have I been, you know, how long have I been with you? He said, he said, if you want to see the Father, look at me. So you want to know about God, look at the life of Jesus. And see what he did. And what he, what he did reveals the heart of the Father. So here Jesus said this, he said, he tells us to abide in his love And then he tells us how to do it. He said, keep my commandments. Now, he's not necessarily talking about the Ten Commandments per se there. He's he's talking about his word, which includes the Ten Commandments. But he's just saying, if you do what I tell you to do, then you will abide in my love. So it's crazy. for If if anybody ever tells you you don't have to keep the Bible anymore or or do what Jesus says to do, just turn them off and, you know. But I'll just, I'll stick with Jesus. Amen. And on top of that, what Paul taught was not different than what Jesus taught. <laughs> it's the same. You know, people, people try to try to say, oh, it's different. And no, it wasn't. It was the same. You know, I mean, so you're, you're just looking at it. You're looking at it wrong if you think it's different. Amen. <clears throat> so then he, he goes on to say this. These things in verse 11, these things I've spoken to you that your joy that my, excuse me, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Amen. Glory to God. So, you know, I mean, and now I think we would all agree that when our prayers are answered, that makes us pretty happy. Yeah. 
How do our prayers get answered? Well, we abide in him and his word abides in us. And then we bear fruit. Amen. And his joy remains. And, and, uh, and then our joy is full. Amen. So he goes on and, and uh, he says some other things, but um, turn over to 1 Corinthians. But why, why do we not, why do we not uh, walk that out? Why do we not see that more than, than we do? Because the reality is, and we all know it, the majority of people, <clears throat> they don't see their prayers answered. Um, they don't see the majority of their prayers answered. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Most, a lot of times it's because they're praying wrong prayers. And they're, they're not praying the new covenant prayers. They're, they're, a lot of them are still praying old covenant prayers. Begging God to do something that he's already done. Come on. Yeah, praying if it's his will. And, you know, and they're, they're ignorant of what, what happened on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You know, I mean, so there's a lot to that. But, but look here at verse 14. This, to me, this is a key, and this is what I believe the Lord uh, was showing me in this. And then we're going to turn to Matthew 14 and, and hit my main point this morning to where, where, where I'm wanting to get to. But here in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, now listen to what this says. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now listen, one of the biggest problems with the church today is they don't know how to get in their spirit. They're still trying to understand God up here. <clears throat> and how many of you know, you, if you try to understand God with your natural mind, you're, you're going to be, man, you're going to struggle. Because God's not a, he's not, let me, I, I mean, I'll say this, but God is not a natural mind God. He's a spirit. And if you're going to understand him, you're going to understand him here, not here. And the problem with the majority of people is that, they're, that they stay here trying to figure God out. And they and they can't they can't make the connection because Paul listen Paul said it's foolishness when you try to figure God out up here, but when you trust Him here, then everything kind of all of a sudden you start understanding some things and you start seeing some things. Now this is gonna this I want you to remember that because that's this is gonna play a big part in what I want to show you here what the Lord what the Lord showed me in uh, so let's turn to Matthew fourteen. <clears throat> I'm giving you about a month's worth of preaching here in one service, so y'all fill in the blanks. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you with that, amen? <laughs> so, um, so here in Matthew 14, we have the, the feeding of the 5,000. <clears> you know, Jesus, <clears throat> man, that's a whole other great sermon within itself. Jesus comes up and asks, um, you know, asks the, uh, one of his disciples, you know, how, you know what, where, where are we going to get food to feed these people? And, you know, Peter, or one of them pops up and says, man, if we had, you know, if we had so much money, we, we you know, we couldn't, we couldn't feed that many with this much money. And another one said, well, we have this little bitty lunch here, but what's that among so many? So they didn't have enough money and they didn't have enough stuff. But yet Jesus, Jesus said he, you know, the scripture tells us he knew what he was going to do. He, he gave thanks for what he had and then it multiplied. And, and, you know, you can, you can figure the rest of that out because <laughs> I want to get to the next part of this. So after Jesus feeds the 5,000, he sends to the disciples, he, he says, he tells them, you get in the ship and go to the other side. I'll meet you over there. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to send the people away and then I'll meet you on the other side. So they get in the boat, all 12 of the disciples, they get in the boat and start going to the other side of the sea, the other side, on the other side there. Jesus sends the people away. And then just what I said earlier, what does he do? He goes to the mountain to be with the Father. He's with the Father all evening into the fourth watch of the night, which is about three o'clock in the morning. The disciples are on the middle of the, in the middle of the sea fighting for their lives, right? Jesus it comes, the Bible says that, that he, he comes walking by them, you know, and, and they, they yell out in fear because they think it's a ghost, and, and we kind of laugh at the disciples a lot of times, but if you were in the middle of the sea in a raging, 
in a raging storm and you saw somebody walking on the sea, you'd think it's a ghost too. Think it's something, I don't know. Because, you know, you just don't see people walking on water. Now remember, where had Jesus been? <clears throat> he had been with the Father. He came down, he's walking on water. Lord, teach me to pray. <laughs> yeah, give me, some, give me some mountain experiences, right? But, but you know, you got this, this story is familiar here. But I want to pick up here in verse uh, 26, Matthew 14, 26. So it says, so when the disciples saw him, well, verse 23, now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the water. And when the, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I, do not be afraid. Now I'm going to read this and I want to come back. So let's, we'll get the context here. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. What a, I mean, what an incredible Amen. statement. Now, you know, and now whether Peter, whether Peter was, whether that was a statement of doubt, him just saying, Lord, if that really is you, if that's not a ghost, you know, bid me to come. Or whether Peter said, I'm going to put you to the test. If that really is you and you're walking on water, then I can walk on water. You know, but Peter said, Lord, if that's you, if it's really you, bid me to come to you. So he, so Jesus said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on water to go to Jesus. Glory to God. But now listen, but when he saw the wind, which the wind, when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, um, I was reading that scripture one morning and uh, I was reading through Matthew and, and I just came across that scripture. And man, that statement, why did you doubt, just jumped out at me. And you know, and, and, we, and we're, we're awful bad to give the disciples a hard time. You know, and, and, and you know, oh, why did Peter doubt, man? He was, he was doing so good. Listen, there was 11 others in the boat shaking, scared for their life that didn't get out. At least Peter stepped out of the boat and started walking, right? The other 11, I, I think the other 11 in there saying, you're crazy. What are you doing? You're going to die. You know, get back in this boat. I don't think they were cheering him on. I think they were, you know, what are you doing? You're crazy. <clears throat> but but here's, here's where I want you to see this. So, so they're, they're in the boat. They see Jesus. He calls out and he says, okay. He said, it is I. Don't be afraid. Peter makes that declaration. He said, Lord, if it's you, Bid me come. Now, let me ask you this question. Was the, was the storm still going on? Right? It says they were in the middle of the storm. They were, I mean, they were struggling. Now, these were professional fishermen. Some of them were. They, I mean, they, you know, so they weren't novices at, this, at being on the water. So, so they said, you know, so the, the wind was blowing, the waves were crashing. And, and Jesus, they just see him walking on top of the waves, walking on the water. And Peter says, you know, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. And he, and he said that word. He said, come. So see, really, the way I like to read this and the way I like to, to teach this is this. Peter didn't necessarily walk on the water. Peter walked on the word. When Jesus said, come, that one word from him, from Jesus, gave Peter the authority to walk on whatever was, was below him. So Peter stepped out of the boat on Jesus' word. And he's walking on water. He's walking on top of their biggest problem. Whatever, whatever storm is raging in your life right now, when you get a word from God, you can step out and you can walk on top of whatever it is that, that's blowing and raging at you. And Peter stepped out of the boat and was walking on the word of God on the word that Jesus gave him, he was walking on, that, on top of his problems, walking toward Jesus. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> but then something interesting happened. The scripture tells us, then when Peter saw, 
Now listen, when he saw that the wind was boisterous and that the waves were great. Now let me ask you, wasn't the wind boisterous and the waves great before? Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians 2. I mean, just you don't have to turn there, but just think in your mind. 1 Corinthians 2 tells us that, the, that when you're thinking naturally, you can't receive from God. That it has to be spiritually discerned. So what happened here was this. Peter was, was, in, was spiritually discerning. He was spiritually walking on the water, walking on that word. But then when he allowed himself to get back over into the flesh... When, when, he, when he started thinking about the circumstances, when he started thinking about, hold up, I, I, I can't walk on water. Now see, that was a right statement. Peter couldn't walk on water. And, he, and really, like I said, he wasn't really walking on water. He was walking on the Word. You see, and in your life, you really, you can't, you can't overcome disease in your natural body but when you have a word that disease will disappear come on and see and it's when you when you allow yourself to when you allow yourself to keep focus if i abide in him and his word is abiding in me if you gaze upon that bronze that bronze serpent you'll be healed if if you keep your focus if you, if you look at the story of Mary and Martha, we are all familiar with that story. And, you know, and, and, and the Bible says when Jesus came into the house there, that Mary, Mary dropped at his feet and was listening, but Martha was busy, right? You're, there's three times, there's three times that, that we see Mary, Martha's sister, in, in, the, in the, the Gospels. And you realize all three times you see her, you know where she is? She's at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus told Martha that day, he said, Martha, Martha, you're concerned about so many things. He said, but Mary has chosen the one thing. Remember, there's no multitasking in the spirit. One thing, and that's to be at the feet of Jesus. Peter, one thing, come, walking on the water. But when he saw when he saw the wind and the circumstances and, and he heard what everybody was saying, he, he heard what, what John and what, what Bartholomew and, and what all these other people were in the, in the boat were saying, get back in here, you're going to drown, what are you doing? You can't do that. It got his eyes off of Jesus and back in the natural. And as soon as he got his eyes off Jesus and back in the natural, what happened? He began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, help me. Jesus saved him. Now, man, I mean, you, could, you could talk a lot about that, but let's keep going and see what he said. Because this, this, to me, here's, here's, what, here's the point I want to get to. He said, it says, Jesus reached out and, he said, and, and uh, Peter cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. And he said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt now, I read that, 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 that day that I was reading that, that it jumped out at me. Just that, that one question Jesus asked Peter. He said, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Now, a lot of times we think Jesus was rebuking Peter. You know, oh, you have little faith. Where's your faith at? Boy, you ain't got no faith. What, you're, you know, you ain't wor you're worthless. You got no faith. That's not what Jesus was doing. Listen, Peter was walking on water. How many of you have walked on water? <laughs> Peter was doing something none of us have ever done. So let's, so, so let's not give Peter a hard time yet, right? But, but, he asked, but Jesus asked the question. And, and really, if you read that in the original language, it's interesting because some commentators say that where Jesus said, Oh, you of little faith, that, that was like one phrase. Like, like it was almost like, a, like a, a, a name that Jesus labeled Peter with, like a nickname. Like he was telling, oh, little faith. You know, and it wasn't a rebuke. It was a name that Jesus called him, oh, little faith. But then he asked this question. Listen to this. He said, why did you doubt? Now, why would he ask a question like that? 
Because, see, now what, what is the word doubt? When you look up the word doubt, it has a couple meanings, but to doubt means this. It means to waver. It means to hesitate. There's one, the, you know, in the, the original language paints pictures, and, and one of the pictures it paints about the word doubt is you're standing at a crossroads, and you don't know which way to go, so you don't go either way. It freezes you. It, it makes you stand in one place. You know, and, and you don't know which way to go, this way or that way, this way or that way, and you just stay there. In the book of James, um, just hold your place here, we'll come back, but turn over to James chapter 1, very familiar passage, but we see this, we see this exact word used, and I think it paints a great picture here. James chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, James chapter 1, 5 and 6, <clears throat> It says this, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and without reproach and he will, and it will be given to him. But then look at verse six, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. In other words, with no wavering, no going between two opinions not having two minds, not having two thoughts about something. In other words, single focused. You ask in faith and you believe and you stay true to that and you don't come off of that. Regardless of the circumstances, regardless of how often your body's screaming at you saying, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. No, Jesus, the word. I'm standing on the word. I'm not, I'm not going to let that distract me. I'm not going to let that waver. He says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting for he who doubts or he who wavers, he who hesitates is like a, is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. The Amplified adds this. I like the Amplified. It says, only, only it must be in faith that he asks with no wavering, no hesitating, no doubting. For the one who wavers or hesitates or doubts is like the billowing surge out at sea that is blown hither and thither and tossed by the wind. So Jesus asked the question, why did you doubt? Now I was I was I was preaching that I was preaching that at Destiny, and right in the middle of my preaching, I mean, this just came out, and I hadn't thought about this. I mean, I hadn't, I mean, you know, I, I hadn't. It wasn't a planned statement, but but as I was preaching, I just made this statement. I said, I said, if Jesus Himself came and stood in front of us today, I think one of the first questions He would ask us is, "Son or daughter, why did you doubt?" Because, now listen, how many scriptures do we have on healing? I mean, man, we've got hundreds of them, right? Why do we doubt them? If the word of God is always right, then why do we question what the word says? And why do we act like it's not true? So I think, I think if Jesus stood before us today, many of us, he would look at us and say, why, why have you doubted what I've said? See, because Peter was walking on water and Jesus didn't say, oh man, you almost made it. You know, man, if you just had stronger faith, if you just believe me more. But see, what Jesus asked him was this, why did you, and, and I'll, I'll add to this, but really we could say it this way. Jesus said, why did you doubt my word? I said, come. You were walking on my word. Why did you start hesitating? Why did you start wavering from walking on what I told you? Look at Romans chapter 4. The story, I mean, very familiar again. The story of Abraham, right? Romans chapter 4. And we'll just look at like verse 19 starting in verse 19. I mean, very familiar. 
he says this, he says, and not being weak in faith, this is Romans 4, 19, not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he, since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver, that, that's that same word, he did not doubt, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. But he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, you know, I know you can preach this a lot of different ways. But I want you to, that, that, that back, in, back in verse uh, 17, I think, it, or 19, where he said he did not consider his own body. Now, let me ask you this. Did Abraham know his body was a hundred? Yeah. So when it says he did not consider it, it's not that he it's not that he just had no thought about his body. He knew that his body was a hundred. He knew that him and Sarah were past childbearing age. I mean, that wasn't a secret to him. But I, I believe when it says he did not consider it, you know, Brother Hagen, Brother Hagen made this statement. And, and I used to struggle with this when I first heard it, I mean, really and truly, because, uh, because I didn't understand it. But now, after you, know, after you walk things out and, and you, know, you, you experience some things, you start to understand it. But Brother Hagin made this statement. He said, he said, you can have faith in your heart with doubt in your head. You see, because I, when, when I first started learning about faith, I thought I had to be perfect. I thought, man, if I, if I have one doubt in my head, then God's just going to, man, he's, you know, forget it. I'm not going to receive anything. But now, but remember, what, what did we say? Where, where, how do we receive from God? Do we receive from God up here? Or do we receive from God here? We receive from, from our spirit. So listen, your mind can have all kinds of 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 different thoughts, doubts, and, and questions. But here's the question, but here's the, here's where, where all this comes in. The question is, what are you going to allow to dictate what you believe? If you meditate long enough on your thoughts, then your doubt will lead you to unbelief. But if you meditate longer on the word of God and you abide in the word of God more than you, more than you allow yourself to abide with the doubts and questions you have in your head, then guess what? Faith will be built in your heart. And you can receive from God even, even when you don't understand it up here. And see, and so Peter, I, I think you go back to Peter, you go to Abraham here, the stories we saw. Peter was walking on water and I'm sure every step he took, he, he was in his mind, he was thinking, this is crazy. Have any of you ever obeyed God? And, and, and every, every step you take and every word you say, you're thinking, this is the craziest instructions he's ever told me to do. But yet you, could, you kept taking those steps because he told you to do it. I'm trusting him. I'm, because, because listen, if you stop and you start thinking, you start having another opinion, then instead of walking toward Jesus, all of a sudden you're doing this. Ah. <laughs> you crash and burn. Why? Because you took your eyes off of the word and off of Jesus and you, and, and you let, you let that doubt and you let, you started to waver and you started being tossed like a wave. Now it says Abraham did not consider his body, you know, at, knowing that he was about a hundred years old and, and the deadness of Sarah's room, wounds. He did not doubt, but it says, but he did not doubt the promise of God through unbelief. But he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. So Abraham allowed his trust. Now listen, was Abraham perfect? You know, I think Abraham at times, I think he doubted. You know why I think he doubted? One word, Ishmael. I mean, come on. I mean, if he, if he had not doubted in that moment, he would, have, he would have told Sarah, no. I don't want to go and sleep with your handmaiden. You know, your 20-year-old maid. No. 
Well, come on. He, he, because Abraham, Abraham was said, because, because the promise is true. But you know what? Abraham wasn't perfect. And, and, and you know, I'm, I'm so glad that God put that in the scripture. Because it showed us we don't have to be perfect. But if we're going to receive from him, there's a way we do it. And if we get off in the flesh, if we get off up here, then guess what? Then we're not going to receive from him. But if you stay true to his word, if you stand on his word, then you know what? You can live your life without a doubt. Because you're standing on the word. And you're not letting that word and you're not letting the doubt or you're not letting um, the, the unbelief dictate. You know, in other words, you're letting the spirit of God move you and not your thoughts. Last scripture, Mark 11, I think. Mark 11. Very familiar. You all know this. <clears throat> but, but it uses the same word in here. There's another instance, uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 20. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but, but that's the scripture where uh, Acts 10, 20 is where uh, Peter's up on the housetop and he has the vision. Right there was Peter, right? And, and, and you know, the people come, the, the three people come to, from uh, uh, Cornelius' house. And, and, uh, but while, in that whole process in Acts chapter 10, verse 20, the Lord tells him, he said this, Go with them doubting nothing. Don't question anything. Stand on my word. I'm telling you my word. Go with them doubting nothing. And what we have to do, listen, what we have to do, we have to have God's word and we have to, we have to stand on his word doubting nothing. And our problem is that we, that we try to come up with every excuse why not to believe it. Well, yeah, but. I know the word says that, but. You know, yeah, the, the word says that, but, but you know, uh, Aunt, Aunt, Aunt Billy Bob, you know, or, or Aunt Susie over there, you know, she tried to do that and it, and it killed her. And see, we start, we start wavering. But look here, Mark 11, I mean, you know this scripture. Mark 11, 20, 20, you know, this is the story where he curses the fig tree, comes back the next day, is dried up, the disciples are amazed. Jesus says in verse 22, you know, have, have faith in God. And then but verse 23, he tells them how he did this. He said, for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart. So in other words, you, he doesn't waver. I guarantee you, we have all spoke to mountains and then as soon as we said the word, we started wavering. You know, we'll speak to that mountain. Man, we're bold, we're confident. You know, we're speaking to that giant. And then before we're out the door, we're thinking, dear Lord, I hope that worked. <laughs> you know, I, I sure hope something changed. Well, guess what you just did? You just wavered. Yeah, it's, it's not a, it's not a, I, I sure hope, you know, it's not a hoping and a praying prayer. But, but, you know, when he, when he said, you say in your heart, you speak to that mountain and you say it and you believe what you said, you'll have what you say if you don't doubt it in your heart. Now, listen, how can, how can we, how can we live our lives without a doubt? It's when we say what God says is when we have his word on the situation that we're, that we're praying about. I, you know, I, I, I make this statement a lot, and, and uh, sometimes people turn their heads a little bit at it, but, but I think sometimes, I think a lot of times we pray too quick. Yes. I think people, people start just, they start, they start with these uh, buckshot prayers and just hoping something hits. Yeah. You know, instead of, instead of taking the time. Now, sometimes, yes, sometimes it takes an immediate prayer. Sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a crisis. It's a, it's a right now, I've got to pray right now. I mean, that's, that's different. But just, just normal circumstances in your life, sometimes you need to spend time with the Lord. You need to go to the mountain and say, Lord, what, what do I pray about this? What do I say to this mountain? Give me a word on this. 
And then when he gives you that word, when he, when he gives you a scripture, when he gives you that word, that's when you can speak it with confidence and you can speak it with boldness. And that's when you'll see that word come to pass and you won't have doubt in your heart. How many of you, how many of you have ever gotten a word from God and it's just give you such confidence and such boldness versus when you've prayed for something and you don't really know your prayers are different. If you know you've heard from God, man, there ain't nothing going to get you off that. Whereas if, you, if you're not sure, man, I've tried this 322 other times and it hadn't worked. I'll give it another shot. That's not a very faith-filled prayer. Amen. And, and there comes a time when, when you, have to, you have to stand on the Word and, avoid, and, and, and ignore the circumstances. What was it when, when the, the woman with the issue of blood, right? And, and Jesus was going with, with, with uh, uh, the, the, the leader there, and he was going with him to his house to pray for his daughter, <clears throat> the, Roman, the Roman centurion. And, and you know, and, and the, the, while Jesus is dealing with the woman with the issue of blood, people came from their house and said, don't bother the master anymore, she's dead. And I love the Amplified version of that because it says, the Amplified says, overhearing but ignoring what they said, he looked at him and said, only believe. Only believe. Only believe. Amen. And see, so sometimes, sometimes you got to ignore circumstances. Sometimes you got to ignore the way people are acting. And you got to stand on the word. You got to stand on, on the word and say, no, here's what the word says. Only believe. Mm. Hallelujah. A couple, a couple, uh, I'm, I'm finishing up here, but a couple different translations on that Matthew 14, uh, where Jesus says, you know, why did you doubt? Listen to this. The passion said this, why would you let doubt win? The message says, what got into you? <laughs> In other words, you know, you were believing good. You were, I mean, you were, you were standing on the word. What got into you? Another translation said, what made you hesitate? Another one says, why did you falter? Why did you waver? And then, uh, the, 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 another one says, why were you in two minds having two opinions about it? How do we live a doubt-free life? We stay focused on the Word. We abide in Him and He abides in us. Nothing takes us off that. You know, I'll go back to Peter. I, 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 we mentioned this, but, but the storm was raging before Jesus got there. The storm was ra raging when Peter stepped out of the boat. It was still raging when he was walking on water. But yet, even in the, even in the midst of the supernatural, even in the midst of such, a, such a, a miracle that Peter was walking on the water, he allowed circumstances to take him off of it. He allowed what he saw in the natural stop him from receiving what God had, had spoken to him and told him. So I want, you, I want to ask you this question as we close this morning. If Jesus were standing before us, would he, would, would he be able to ask that question to us, why have you doubted my word? Why are you of two minds about this situation? What's made you falter? What's made you, what's made you waver and change from what my word says to what you're seeing in the natural. And it's, it's as easy, listen, it's, and I say it's easy, but <laughs> the, the process is to renew our mind, continually to renew our mind with what His Word says. The first, the first instance you get of wavering, of doubting, of unbelief, of, of you know, something trying to change you and take you off of that, go back to the Word God gave you. Amen. If Peter, if Peter had have looked, Peter could have looked and saw those waves. Man, he could have seen a 10-foot wave coming at him. But he could have looked back and said, nope, Jesus said, come. Jesus said, come to him. I'm keeping my eyes on him. You know what? He just would have rode that wave right on to Jesus. 
But instead, he allowed that wave to, to, to change. He allowed that wave to knock him off. I just want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you this morning. Don't waver from God's word. Regardless of the circumstance, regardless of how things look, stay with God. Stay true to his word. Don't let, don't let the circumstances and, and what you see in the natural change. See, because I know some of you have been saying in a long time. Some of you have been, been believing God a long time for things. And listen, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's sometimes, yes, it can be hard. It can be, it can be tough when, when you know, you've stood for years and you've believed God for something and you hadn't seen it and everything in the natural screaming at you is getting worse. That's true. That's true. But listen, I want to ask you this. What does God's Word say? Yes. What Scripture are you standing on? What, what, what is the foundation of your belief? Yes. It's not, that, it's not that, that I just believe randomly that God's going to do something. No, we have Scripture. Yes, new, te- new covenant prayer, new, new covenant prayer, the, our, our prayer that we pray is based on the death, burial, and resurrection. It's finished. It is. it's a done, the, the work is finished. We just have to appropriate that in our lives. And we have to stand on, stay true to what Jesus has done. Listen, he's not coming back to do something extra special for you. (laughs) He's already done it. I I, I say this a lot of times, you know, the one prayer I can guarantee you he's not going to pray or not going to answer is is you asking him to do something he's already done. Because if you're asking him to come back and, and touch you and heal you and, 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 you know, if you're asking him to do that in the now, then what you're saying is what he did on the cross wasn't good enough. What, what the prayer you need to be praying is, Lord, it was taken care of on the cross. You finished it on the cross. You took care of that. So right now I'm walking in this. You said it's mine and I'm, I'm receiving it right now. It's not we're asking him to do something new and different. We're just receiving what he's already done. Amen. And the great news is this. Here's the great news. Regardless of where your belief has been, regardless of how much you've doubted, regardless of how much you've wavered, when when you make that one adjustment in your heart to say, nope, I'm standing on the word, then guess what? You can be just like Peter and start walking on top of those circumstances. And if you don't have a word, if you don't know, if, if you, if, you know, if you have a situation in your life and, you know, I saw Brother Hagin do this and I used to think he's so mean. People would come up, people would come up for prayer and just randomly, I mean, he wouldn't do it to everybody, but, but I, I would see him at times, he would come up and, and he would say, what, you know, they would tell him, they would explain to him the situation he was, they were praying about. And he would say, what scripture are you standing on? And if they hesitated, if they had to sit there and think, let's see, um, uh, What's one of those healing scriptures? Uh, uh, let's see, Peter. Something, what, what did Peter say? Peter, uh, yeah, yeah, by his stripes, I'm here. You know, Brother Hagin looked at him and said, get, get sit back down. He's like, you know, you have to be standing on the word. He said, I can lay hands on you until I rub the hair off your head. But listen, if you don't have the word, if you, if you don't have the word, what God says, if you don't have it hidden in your heart, then yeah, you might get you might get a manifestation at that moment, but when you walk out that door, it's going to attack you again, and and you'll be in worse shape than you were to begin with. Come on, there's a part we play in this, guys. Now we don't not not works. I'm not saying works, but but listen, we it's it's up to us to believe, right? Our part is to believe. And our part is to stand on the word. We have, listen, every one of us today, we have a choice. We stand at that crossroads to say, are we going to believe God or are we going to believe circumstances? Are we going to believe God or are we going to, to give in to the wind and the waves and the, and the storm? And how, what you choose at that moment will dictate what happens to you. Now, thank God that crossroad comes back. If we make the wrong choice, he allows us to come back to that crossroad and say, okay, I want to use you. You know, I want to, I want to stay with your word. But listen, it's time that we start acting like the word of God is true and like we believe it. Yes. Amen. 
So this morning, listen, and here's the, here's the great thing. Here's the awesome thing about this. Yes, it's great to have hands laid on you. Yes, it's great to, it's great to have other people praying for you. But your prayers are just as effective as anybody else's. And when you stand, when you get the word and when you stand on the word, come on, it's just as powerful as if the biggest name preacher would lay hands on you. Now there's, there's power in that too. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I love laying hands on people and praying for people, but here's the great thing. You don't have to have that. You can get it yourself. Amen. Now we, we can come around people and we can love them and support them and, and, you know, and believe God with them. And we do that. But isn't it much better to know that you can get the answers just like everybody else does. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? So I hope I encourage you this morning. I hope, I hope maybe you saw some things that, that where you've been doubting, you've been wavering, and that's why you hadn't got those answered prayers yet. And as, as, we, as we stand and as we believe God and we stand on the Word and we walk on the Word that God get, has given us, then we'll walk, right, we'll walk right on top of those circumstances. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand to our feet in just a moment. <clears throat> Let's see what the Lord wants to do this morning. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Let's just pray. Let's pray in the spirit for a moment. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, uh, I just I, I just heard. I mean, just I was trying to make sure I heard that right. But but um, and I said this at the beginning I, that that the Lord was going to help us. And if if you came here this morning, if you came here this morning saying I need help, then then I want you to come down and I want us just to I want us to gather around those that need help this morning. And just with the power of the Holy Ghost. Just to believe God that help, help is here. Amen. There's no better place than, than, than right here in the presence of the Lord to receive help. Amen. Amen. So if you came this morning and just, and, and your heart was, man, I just, I need help. You know, there's some things happening. There's some things going on in my life. I just, I just, you know, I just need help. Just come on down and we're just going to pray for you. I just believe God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, let's just lift our hands for a moment. Come on, just worship him this morning. Worship him. Hallelujah. Get, and listen, come on. Get your eyes on the Lord this morning. Get your eyes on Him. Get a picture of Him in your mind. Get your mind off the circumstances, off the problems. And just see Jesus this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Uh, those other ones that, that haven't come down for help, just come up to someone and just stand behind them and just pray for them. If you if you if, if just come up and just pray, stand behind them and pray for them. Just pray for help. Pray for uh, touch from the Lord this morning. Hallelujah! Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you for your help this morning, Lord. Thank you for your help this morning, Lord. Thank you for your help this morning, Lord. Thank you for your help this morning, Lord. Thank you for your help this morning, Lord. Thank you for your help this morning, Lord. Thank you for your help this morning, Lord. Thank you for your help this morning, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Yeah, fresh opportunities. Fresh opportunities is coming your way. I see I see the, the Lord just uh, um, some desires, some dreams of yours that you've been believing God for for years. I see those things being like uh, rebirthed. And God's gonna God's gonna renew and refresh some of those things, and that those opportunities that that you thought should have happened years ago, those opportunities are gonna come. I mean, they're they're coming right now, and you're gonna experience those quickly. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your help, 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 Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your help. Thank you for your help, Lord. Thank you for your help, Lord. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your help, Lord. Praise your name. You shake my hands, Zach. Amen. Thank you for your help this morning, Lord. Thank you for your help for this young man, Lord. Oh, may the power of God fill him in Jesus' name. The power of God fill him this morning in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. In the name of Jesus. Thank you for help this morning, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Call for the elders, which is a plurality of ministry. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Mm. Believe, receive, and rejoice. We believe. We are in a house of great believers this morning. And all that we have need of is in Jesus. I didn't come to healing school this morning. I've come to Jesus. Healing school just points me where I need to go. Amen. But I need the help of the saints this morning. James 5, he says, is there any sick among you? Sick can take many different kinds of manifestations. Body sickness, mental sickness, financial sickness. And though all is well this morning, I'm sure I'm not the only one that has, has need of things greater than my own ability. I was on the phone with one of our dear sisters, and, and we, we, we know this. We're, we're not separate in this house this morning. We're one. We're as much one with each other as we are one with Christ. 
Let that cook your noodle for a little while. But James 5 says, is there any sick among you? You know, a lot of times we're like the little woman. We go to the doctor. He ain't got the answer. We go to the specialist. He ain't got the answer. And we got a young man over here that the enemy's trying to take him out. And I'm just here to say in the name of the Lord boldly, not on our watch. So I was talking to his mother, Anna, today, and I said, hmm, I'm going to healing school. I think that's where Zachary needs to come. Amen. And we just, how many of you believe the devil will double team you? You ever felt double teamed? Pastor Gwen, you ever felt a time or two maybe? Well, we're going we're to double, triple, quadruple team the enemy. Amen. This morning, Zachary, come here, baby. I hear the Lord saying we are in a house of spiritual specialists today. Spiritual specialist. With all the word that we've had in this house concerning healing, if we ain't got it by now, we ain't gonna get it. Zachary. How many of you love this young man? Amen. 